Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much indeed for joining this uh, bite-sized uh, presentation uh, organised by the Australian Critical Communications Forum. Let me uh, start just by uh, explaining who the Australian Critical Communications Forum is. Uh, essentially, we're a chapter of the uh, Global uh, Critical Communications Association, and we're, we're passionate about uh, standards-based uh, innovations in critical communications. The ACCF is a little unique in that we represent all market participants, uh, users, industry, uh, and regulators and standards bodies. We uh, mainly work on bringing international experience to uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, for the benefits of our local critical communications organisations. And of course, we take uh, innovations from Australia and New Zealand uh, globally. Uh, recently, we've had presentations uh, from a number of uh, Australian market participants uh, to uh, Critical Communications Broadband Group, uh, the uh, Critical Com Communications World, and a number of other forums. We, uh, we, we're passionate about participation, as I said, and we're always keen to get new members. Uh, for any of you wishing to uh, join and participate in our activities, uh, please take a look at our website for uh, affordable options for joining. So today we've got a, uh, a very exciting lineup of speakers. Uh, you'll see from the, uh, from the agenda that we have uh, James Corkill uh, from the New South Wales Telco Authority, Peter Hudson, Chief Technology Officer from Sapura. Uh, and I should say for Peter, he's up in the middle of the night. He's talking from the UK. Uh, Peter Scarlatta, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Simico Wireland Solutions. Dion Stevenson, uh, Product Manager Unified Solutions from Tate. Uh, Dr. Rob Joyce, Chief Technology Officer from Nokia Oceania. Uh, Ranjan Bhagat, uh, Vice President and GM of Zetron. And Kevin Graham, uh, ACCF Director. And uh, congratulations to Kevin. He's also the uh, elect CEO for the Critical Communications Association. So rather than waste any more time, I'll hand over to James to begin today's presentations. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, look, let me just start by saying um, thank you to the uh, ACCF, uh, Roger and his team and, and the TCCA for um, setting up today's um, series and bite-sized presentations, some really awesome um, presenters. So um, really looking forward to this session. Um, just give me a second here and I'll um, take us through to the next slide. Um, so look, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm James Corkill, the Chief Technology Officer at the New South Wales Telco Authority. And um, I'm going to provide an update on critical communications um, from a New South Wales perspective, an update and overview. So just to kick off with who is the New South Wales Telco Authority. I'm sure some of you are, are familiar with who we are and, and what we do, but um, for those who aren't, um, we are the responsible agency for delivering critical communications, in particular, the public safety network for frontline emergency services within New South Wales. We're also responsible for the implementation of the New South Wales Government Operational Communications Strategy, which we relaunched in 2020. Um, the strategy covers operational communications, and also extends to statewide connectivity initiatives, including the associated technology roadmaps. So with the theme of today's bite size event, um, I'm gonna to touch on a couple of our major programs or provide an update on a couple of our major programs and projects, um, some of our recent achievements and innovations in products and services, um, some future innovation opportunities, and I'm really excited to touch on um, the launch of our connectivity innovation network, which is an opportunity for engagement um, with the government, with industry and academia um, on solving some of our most challenging problem statements across the state. However, before I jump into this, and given the theme of today's sessions, I wanted to take the opportunity to look back on events over the last couple of years. Just go back one, sorry. Um, so critical communications, what is it? What's why is it important? Um, I think, as you can see here, the, the context over the last couple of years for critical communications 
it's certainly been a busy time for our frontline emergency services staff. Um, and I wanted to pause to say thank you to all of those full-time and also volunteer staff who, are, who have helped keep our um, community safe and protected through these periods. You know, these are the people who are running towards a bushfire, uh, who are, you know, wading through floodwaters while we're all running the other way. So uh, hats off and um, look, by extension, I think with the number of events um, that we've had in recent times, um, this has created a, a really busy operational period for those uh, involved in the provision of critical communications, not only across our state, um, but also within the region and, and globally. Um, I'll kick off with some a bit of an overview on each of these events. Um, the 2019 bushfire season will definitely be remembered as one of the worst in living memory. We saw multiple large fire fronts across the state, including multiple instances of mega fires where fire fronts combined. These fires raged for eight months with over 10,000 fire incidents. They burned through 5.5 million hectares of land, which is an area larger than the size of Switzerland destroyed over 2,000 homes and resulted in the tragic loss of 26 lives in New South Wales alone. On some days, the air quality was hazardous. The fires made Sydney the most polluted city in the world. It's unbelievable stuff. The 1920 bushfire season created, also created an intense operational period for support of the public safety network, um, including over eight PSN sites damaged, damaged Two sites were completely destroyed, but many more saved through the intervention of the firefighting agencies. We were able to uh, fast track and operationalise 24 new radio sites to support emergency re the emergency response. Um, we had the deployment of over 30 cell on wheels and over 140 generator deployments. Ultimately, the thing that eventually put the fires out was rain, but it didn't arrive steadily. It arrived in torrents on parched baked land and resulted in floods that saw 87 homes destroyed, five, over 5,000 destroyed or damaged structures, and tragically, two lives lost. While the state emergency service were attending to calls for assistance, over 18,000 evacuations and multiple flood rescues, the Telco Authority team were again engaged in ensuring communi continued communications for our customers. With 19 sites impacted by mains power failure during this period, and 28 site access tracks blocked or damaged, we were still able to fast track and operationalise additional an additional nine new radio sites. We assisted with two cell and wheel deployments and maintained site operations with three generator deployments. Somewhat ironically, um, as I stand here or sit here today, we are again engaged in support of our ASOs with the current flood response in regional New South Wales and have a live operation with multiple mobile assets deployed. As if these two incidents wasn't enough, in parallel there's been the ongoing mouse plague across much of regional New South Wales and the overlay of the pandemic, um, something I'm sure I don't need to touch on or explain today. So this context, I think, um, is really important for us. With longer, more intense bushfire periods, increases in the regularity and severity of storms and other weather phenomena, and the continued and increasing expectations on law enforcement and ambulance services to support citizens, enabling efficient operations for emergency services with high quality, reliable and innovative communication solutions will continue to be of utmost importance now and into the future. We are focused on delivering this through four major initiatives, which I'll touch on today. The Critical Communications Enhancement Program, Public Safety Mobile Broadband, our operator maintained transformation and implementation of our connectivity innovation network. So firstly, the Critical Communications Enhancement Program. We are undertaking an expansion of our P25 network via our Critical Communications Enhancement Program. This program is expanding the footprint and enhancing the performance of the public safety network for emergency services. We've committed over $1.4 billion to expand this network, which will increase the coverage to 99.7% of the state's population and 85% geographic coverage. We currently have 308 operational sites in the network and recently hit a milestone of 96% population coverage and 42% geographic coverage. At completion, the program will deliver a total site count of 675 sites across our state this network deployment creates a foundational infrastructure 
the delivery of our current services, but also our, but also future products and services. But we're not just building sites, we're building resilience. This has always been a key tenant of our network design philosophy, but reinforced with, with recent lived experiences. What we've learned during bushfires, floods, and other weather events is that the worst affected areas can often be offline with power not restored for four, five, or possibly more, time, more days. Often the electrical infrastructure or other associated infrastructure is damaged and access or restoration can be unsafe. This has driven our focus on ensuring maximum site autonomy is being designed into the network. This it helps us achieve our target availability of 99.95%. Our grid powered sites are designed to have a minimum of 10 hours battery backup. Hard to access sites and key hubs are designed to have up to 32 hours and our most remote solar sites will have up to 100 and 20 hours of designed autonomy. In addition to the resilience measures, we've been investing heavily in our and in expanding our fleet of cell on wheels and mobile generators, as I touched on earlier. These can be deployed to any affected site across the state as required to ensure continued service delivery. By, need, by mid next year, we'll have 32 cell on wheels and similar mobile assets and over 30 generators and other backhaul supporting technologies. In parallel to this, we are enhancing our operational support environment and have uplifted our operational support agreements. These agreements and the associated operational transformation go hand in glove with our ability to effectively deliver the services our customers require. While we continue to roll out and enhance our existing services for the PSN through these major programs, we're cognizant of the demand for data from our customers to support their day-to-day -day operations. So in parallel, we are running a public safety mobile broadband program to deliver broadband for emergency services. So I know many of you are familiar with PSMB, so I won't go into the background, uh, but I will touch on where we're currently at. In 2018, the Council of Australian Governments came together to announce support for national public safety mobile broadband capability. The Prime Minister announced funding for a PSMB trial and to set up a national PMO. The national PSMB program has six work streams, three of which are led by New South Wales. One of these includes the proof of concept for PSMB, which I'll touch on today. In March 2021, New South Wales, on behalf of all jurisdictions, signed a contract with Nokia to deliver the proof of concept for PSMB. Nokia, alongside partners Optus and TPG, are helping to develop a test LTE and test LTE technology that will inform the design and development of the PSMB delivery model. The proof of concept began in May this year and it will run until August 2022 with testing being conducted for the lab through to production networks. This testing will also include representatives from the emergency services conducting specific test cases along with the interoperability testing to inform future transition strategies. The results of the trial will be used to help inform the design and development of the national PSMB delivery model. So I've touched on our two or three current major programs, but this it's still not enough. Um, we're sort of, we know, and, and I'm sure many of you know as well, um, our customers, the emergency services and, and other critical communications users, they want coverage they want reliability and they want it everywhere, all of the time. Critical communications is no different, except sometimes these requirements mean the difference between life and death. So both of the major programs I've touched on today are focused on terrestrial network delivery. They endeavour to deliver coverage that is seamless and resilient. However, it is time consuming and costly particularly in areas as big as New South Wales, as you can see from this photo here. Um, this extends to Australia and many other parts of the globe. So we need to get smarter with how we deliver services to our customers. And there are three areas of opportunity that we are focusing on. The first of these is interoperability through network interconnections, be it government to government, government to commercial or other. 
The second is network of networks, leveraging existing alternative bearer solutions, Wi-Fi, satellite, commercial networks, and integrating those with the service, services that we provide through LMR. Finally, the innovation and developments that we're starting to see through non-terrestrial 3GPP standardised solutions to deliver connectivity direct to standard mobile devices. And I'm going to touch on each of these areas in a little bit more detail. Our vision is to deliver bearer agnostic connectivity across the state, independent of device and location, and these technologies hold a great deal of promise for this. The obvious extension of this is that these innovations also have the potential to enhance our citizen connectivity across the state, Australia and the world. So let's touch on interoperability. I'm pleased to share that we at the Telco Authority have successfully delivered the first P25 interconnectivity project across Australian jurisdictions. This was done in collaboration with our counterparts who run Queensland's government wireless network. A roaming agreement and connection between our core networks has been established. ESOs on both sides can now benefit from coverage extending beyond their own networks and a seamless experience when they undertake mission critical cross-border operations. The next logical extension to this is interconnectivity of networks to commercial operators. Whilst this exists today to support some of our over the top applications, we cannot yet ensure the same quality of service to support seamless communication between LMR and broadband. This integration in addition to fostering the application and device ecosystem that enable broadband services is a key cornerstone of our technology roadmap and future state. The second innovation I touched on was vehicle as a node. One approach we've taken to addressing some of the challenges of this connectivity everywhere challenge is through the introduction of this technology. We've integrated two supply products to our network and these allow users to communicate on public safety network talk groups outside of our PSN terrestrial network coverage. The vehicle as a node solution leverages multiple technologies such as Wi-Fi, P25, commercial networks, satellite, depending on availability and usage cost. This means our vehicles and node customers, once the vehicle is set up, can have access to public safety network talk groups almost anywhere in the state. A really great initiative for our customers. While we continue to innovate and extend our products and services, the challenge presented to all of us with the digital divide for general citizen connectivity of critical communications still exists. Take the example of Winnering, 1,000 kilometres from Sydney, a population of 140 and one single police officer. How can we ensure this police officer has the same service and connectivity to dispatch as his CBD colleagues? This is where I believe new technologies such as non-terrestrial satellite-based connectivity that is standardised can truly be game changing. We're keen to continue engaging with industry to innovate in this space. And I'm excited to announce that as of last Friday, we have established the Connectivity Innovation Network. As I said, I'm excited to announce that as of Friday, the New South Wales Telco Authority has appointed the University of Technology Sydney and Sydney University as joint leads to run the newly formed Connectivity Innovation Network. The network will bring together government, industry and research organisations to find innovative solutions to connectivity challenges and prototype solutions. We've already created four problem statements that we've put to the Connectivity Innovation Network and we've set aside $1 million in funding for two potential trials in 2022. So for anyone who's on the line or, or listening um, and you're interested, please reach out and engage on these or other potential problem statements and get in contact with the network. Thanks very much for your time today. Um, it's been a privilege to present. Um, really looking forward to continue collaborating, um, as I said, through the Connectivity Innovation Network um, to help solve some of our tricky uh, connectivity problems. Thanks, Roger. Thanks very much, James. That was uh, <clears throat> really impressive. I actually had no idea of uh, the scale uh, of investment or the uh, the focus on innovation that was that was happening in your program, it's really great. Uh, just to attendees, we are going to entertain questions, but in order to keep the presentations kind of running to time, we'll deal with the questions at the end. 
but by all means make a note of them uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen uh, as we go through so that uh, they're not forgotten. Uh, so thank you again, James. Uh, I would like to move on now to uh, introduce Peter Hudson. Uh, Peter is the Chief Technology Officer of Sapura, and he'll be talking to us about uh, a European perspective on the transition from Tetra to uh, Mission Critical LTE. Thanks, Peter. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I can get the slides in order. Okay, maybe not. Ah. Okay, sorry, good, right. So I'm doing for the UK, there's a bit of a delay, so I'll uh, try and get it, get it right. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, and thanks for the intro. Um, I think I've been asked today to talk about a European perspective on the transition from Tetra, which is obviously the predominant um, technology being used uh, in public safety for uh, mission critical comms and moving towards uh, mission critical LTE. Um, so we've only got 15 minutes, it's quite a large topic. Um, so I'll try and cover the, uh, the, the key points as we go through. Okay, so um, just to kind of a, a bit of a, a a kind of positioning statement, I guess. Um, so Supura, um, as I guess, is traditionally known for Tetra um, terminals, so Tetra devices uh, within the market. We've been doing that for quite some time. Um, but realistically, um, it's broadband is part of our evolution. Uh, we're actually a mission critical communications company. Tetra happens to be the predominant standard at the moment, um, which is where we do most of our business. Um, we're actually the leading Tetra Terminal Supplier to Public Safety Worldwide at the moment. Uh, and we actually have, this is probably slightly out of date, almost I think two and a half million radios supplied into critical communication users' hands and actually using them today um, all around the world. So Europe, uh, Australasia, um, USA, South America, et cetera. So um, quite a wide user base with varying uh, requirements. Um, and also across not just public safety, also um, transportation, security, uh, industrial applications, things like mining, oil and gas, etc. So um, all of those industries still need critical communications, whether it's narrowband or broadband. Uh, we bring, I think, quite a lot of um, experience into this, this um, field. Uh, we've got a very deep knowledge of mission critical user needs and requirements, and we always continue to talk to our end users to find out what they want, how they're using the equipment and how we can obviously generate solutions for them for that. Um, so it's one of our, our key things is that that continues innovation um, within the mission critical space. Uh, and that, that doesn't, doesn't slow down at all. In fact, I'd say if anything, it's currently speeding up in terms of how people are using the equipment to doing that. But we've got uh, a lot of experience over 30 years, um, longer than I've been in the business, uh, in developing critical communication standards. So we were involved at the very beginning with the Tetra standard uh, and are still very much involved in developing that. And there's still new developments going on with that currently, um, new features uh, and facilities within the standard. Um, but we also have been involved from the very, very early days with um, 3GPP and the MTPTT standardization, which we saw as very key to being involved in that, not just so we understood um, what was actually going to be produced, but also to um, influence that to make sure that what was actually going to the standards was the, the, if not the correct functionality and the correct level of functionality that our users want and, and everybody else's as well. Uh, and that's been quite a, a long journey, I would say, um, in getting there. There have been certainly some misconceptions, um, some quite big differences across uh, the globe, how the USA sees public safety functionality compared to how uh, Europe does, et cetera. So it has been a very worthwhile um, sort of, uh, if you like, endeavor to do that. And we're still currently very deeply involved in that. It's still progressing and there are still uh, amendments and additions going into that. So I think James has actually set up uh, this very nicely. He did a very, I think, a, made a very sort of clear um, uh, case for the need for mission critical comms. Um, it's unfortunately a growing need. It's not, not going away at all. We have terrorist incidents, we have natural disasters, we've got COVID all around the world. 
Um, and these things don't seem to decrease in volume, but actually increase. And so the need for mission critical comms uh, is becoming more and more. Plus, we're seeing, um, I would say, um, critical national infrastructure, so um, power, water, uh, all the utilities, et cetera, also becoming part of you know, like the, the mission critical infrastructure. So it's, a, it's a, if you like, a sort of a, a growing need. Um, but it's kind of worth just a really a bit of a recap on what actually does, does mission critical mean? Um, and for me, it's always on communications. So whenever you want to communicate, you can, regardless of where you are or what you're doing. Um, and that really boils down to a set of bullet points here, but making sure we have resilient comms, both of the networks and the devices, so they're designed to be real-time mission critical. They don't fail when you need them. You can always rely on that. Um, coverage is a key issue. Again, James highlighted this um, with a very, very great, great picture showing sort of the vast um, sort of amount of area we're going to cover within Australia. Um, we probably in Europe have different coverage issues that we have obviously much smaller land mass, um, but some of the terrain is quite difficult. And again, um, population is very dense. So getting the, the correct amount of coverage can be quite difficult at times, um, but networks need to be designed for that. Focus very much on group oriented services as well, um, which is different to your standard if you want, broadband or LT network. Um, and also de designed for command and control, so preemption rather than queuing and blocking. So regardless uh, of what you're trying to do, your call will get through whether it preempts or it's queued and then gets through um, to be, be sort of dealt with if it's a lower priority call. So I think that's very important to make sure that that, that happens so you don't lose calls. Um, but also very importantly is the whole ecosystem currently is controlled by end user organizations. So they have full control over who is using them, what they can do, uh, the security of it, um, and that, that is a very, very important point of, um, of how they run their networks. Uh, and obviously, the networks, uh, I think this is worldwide, but certainly in Europe, everything is secured to national security standards. So each government body uh, and the EU in general uh, apply certain security standards to all of the mission critical networks. So we have to meet those standards uh, within the network equipment and also within, within, within the terminals as well. Um, and the functionality is rich. Um, I would never call um, any of these mission critical networks just walkie-talkies networks. They, they have a lot of um, very sophisticated um, functionality, uh, both voice and data, uh, and they have been over the years tailored more and more to users' needs. So we have a lot of tailoring and products that, that really fit precisely how people use those products. So they're, they're not generic or off-the-shelf products necessarily. Um, and one of the key things is fallback options as well uh, and direct mode services. So again, whatever the situation is, wherever you're working, whether there's been a you know a major national sort of uh, natural disaster, um, that still needs communications. So that could be, if you like, on site, so the cows, things like that, or direct mode services. So that's um, incredibly important to make sure that everything is available as much as possible to get that always on communications. Uh, as I've mentioned. Um, Tetra is the predominant technology within Europe that's providing at the moment for all of the public safety organisations. And its catch rate is trusted always everywhere, which kind of summarises like mission communications. Um, and it's very important we continue that through into um, the, the mission critical broadband um, technologies that we're going to use for the future. So continuing with Tetra uh, might seem a little bit odd in the sense of talking about broadband, but after 20 years, um, Tetra still is the de facto choice um, for mission critical comms in Europe. Um, we're still seeing only very recently new network um, put in, so a replacement Tetra network to replace an older one in a, as, a, as a major national infrastructure. Um, and all of the existing Tetra networks are planned to be operational for many years. So there is no plan to switch them off in the near term. Um, we're still seeing a new network being rolled out in Europe, the new networks around the world being rolled out. Um, new devices are still being launched. Uh, we launched one last year. Um, one of our competitors launched one this year. So there, there still is that innovation products that are being brought out. Um, but with the products on the networks, um, there is a change occurring, certainly mission critical users of largely, at least to start with the Tetra, relied on voice and still do rely on voice being, if you like, the, the primary means of communication. 
but the use and operation of those devices and networks is evolving to encompass more and more data services and applications. Um, and I think it's actually right that there's a lot of thought at the moment uh, about what they want to take forward from what they have into the broadband era. But there is starting to be more and more thought of what people want in the broadband era that they possibly could now do today with the devices they have and are actually starting to implement some of those applications and data services to actually blend those products almost into their working practices, um, which is um, very important. And a lot of those um, applications actually aren't really broadband. They don't need more for a lot of data. Um, they can be supplied on Tetra. But again, as they start to be embedded in working pro um, practices, they can be carried forward into the um, into the broadband world. Um, but equally, touch networks are being complemented by commercial broadband overlays. So most of our customers um, in public safety have some sort of commercial broadband uh, capability already today, and that's, I think, fairly um, ubiquitous across the world. So what are the challenges in Europe? Um, I actually don't think they're very different from anywhere else in the world in reality. Um, there are challenges for certain, um, but I think if I was to list them out, the first three are spectrum. Um, I think we're in no different situation to most of the world, but spectrum is very, very tight in Europe. A lot of the spectrum that uh, public safety would certainly like to use, we're in 700 meg bands, um, has largely been um, already auctioned off to uh, commercial operators. Uh, and so uh, there is still, um, I think, a lot of thought going on within European governments about how they deploy um, with either limited spectrum or sharing with spectrum. Uh, and the availability of any spectrum varies across a, very, a, very, a lot of countries. So in the UK with ESN, there is absolutely no spectrum at all in addition to the commercial spectrum. So they are um, piggybacking on um, a commercial network. Uh, as an MVNO, essentially, um, but with no additional spectrum for public safety added to that. Whereas in other European countries, they have small amounts of spectrum, 3 plus 3 meg or 5 plus 5, which they're using to augment the commercial networks as well and give them either um, priority access in certain areas or just infill uh, into um, areas where there is currently no um, communications available with the commercial networks. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed picture, but largely starved the spectrum at the moment. And there's a lot of work going on to look at what spectrum could be made available in the sort of 600 meg. Um, certainly spectrum below 700 to see if there are better options there. But again, that won't become available in 2030. So there's quite some time before those are made available. So at the moment, there are small amounts of 700 meg and some higher um, that are being used or being proposed to be used um, for, for new broadband capabilities. Um, user expectations are also um, incredibly high. Um, um, the Tetra services they have um, provide a very, very good service, a very reliable service. Uh, and so it's really important that the service that they um, get with the new uh, broadband capability is as good but also, I think it's it's actually ensuring that users trust the service. If they don't trust the service, they won't use it. Uh, and it's getting that, um, that those expectations set, moving from something that is very mature and very, very reliable and does exactly what they want, is tailored to what they want, um, to move to a new technology, um, they want exactly the same. Uh, and that means exactly the same in terms of reliability, availability, um, and hopefully additional capabilities on, on top of that. Uh, interoperability is also a big factor. Um, a lot of uh, the projects that are starting or going on at the moment are all looking at how they can mix and match capabilities. So not to be tied, if you like, monolithically to one supplier. So can they get servers, MCX servers from one supplier, uh, clients from different ones, devices, uh, network equipment, et cetera. And if you like, mix and match the best bits together to get um, the, the best solution they can, but also um, ensuring that actually there's a, there's a vibrant ecosystem there to make sure that um, there is security of supply. So if one supplier decides either not to uh, advance what they're doing or perhaps exit the, exit the industry, then there are others that can take, take the place as well. So it's all about, again, security, but also that interoperability. So you can you know, always depend on being able to buy equipment, put it together and it working. Um, also, robustness and hardening of the mission critical standards. So um, I think ESN is certainly 
um, the first and leading the way in Europe in terms of um, its its progress uh, on, on on providing mission critical networks. And you know they have been, if you like, finding the uh, the holes in the standards, the the, the quirks, etc. Uh, and those things need to be ironed out to give us again stable um, user expectations. Uh, meet those on the way. Hardening the LT networks are already there. Very important. Um, they're not good enough as they are to become mission critical. They need to be hardened, whether it's additional power supplies, um, communication links, etc. Very important. Um, the other things, uh, availability of devices. It has been hard to create devices with um, chipset availability, having mission critical features. That's something that is very, very important. Starting to ease up now, it's starting to become possible, but still um, a very um, sort of sparse amount of devices available at this point in time. Uh, and direct mode. One of the things certainly with a lot of our users across Europe is they won't actually deploy unless they have direct mode. So if they lose networks, whatever, they must have communications. And that's been a very thorny issue. Uh, and just to move on to that, um, it's been very clear that Prose, which is the, if you like, the 3TPP standard for um, direct mode is not gonna be available or suitable um, for users needs at the moment. The range is very low. Um, the transmit power is only 0.2 watts, which is you know, not, not going to give long range, whatever whatever, whatever happens. Uh, but also the commercial LTE chipset suppliers at this point in time are not adding Prose into their chipsets. So you can't make a device with it in essentially. Um, so other alternatives need to be found really. But with this, in the timescale for deploying the first network, certainly there's gonna be nothing that will be available from, from Prose. Perhaps 5G, but we need to see. So um, across most um, European countries, uh, not all use Tetra, there are one or two don'ts, but most do, then they're going to be staying with the existing Tetra technology. Um, and certainly in Europe, that spectrum for direct mode in Tetra is actually harmonized across all the countries. So cross-border roaming, etc., becomes very easy. Uh, and it's also a very proven um, method of doing sort of device-to-device -device communications. So two real ways of doing this potentially. One is a dual-mode device, so both technologies within a single device, uh, and that obviously can be done, and there are some instances out there of that already today in some devices. The other aspect is what we call uh, dual operation, where we actually repurpose uh, an existing Tetra device um, to operate essentially as a remote speaker mic um, for uh, an MCX device. So it could be a standard smartphone linked by Bluetooth or a cable um, USB. Um, and that um, Tetra device could run in two modes, either as an RSM mode and provide, if you like, a ruggedized um, device that could be worn on the body outside uh, with a you know, big loudspeaker, big PTT. Uh, but when you need to use direct mode, single button press switches it back into Tetra mode again and you can use direct mode directly from the same device, same user interface. Uh, and it's also uh, a common interface for when people are migrating. There's also, um, if you like, it eases the, the transition across the way. And it can also be used obviously in Tetra trunk mode as well. So again, um, during migration, if there are needs to switch backwards and forwards, then it gives some um, options as well. So two possible ways forward to using Tetra in the sort of short to medium term um, with, um, with MCX. Um, but it's all about getting the balance right. Um, hybrid solutions, um, I think most um, countries are certainly looking at um, bringing uh, their mission critical LT capability online alongside their Tetra solutions. Uh, and some of those will be working, Tetra solutions we already know will be working until at least 2030. Um, and they will be, they're planning to, again, into working functions bind them together and make sure we've got seamless communication across all those networks. Um, so that those complementary broadband overlays are starting to be built. Um, they're using shared services, as I said, uh, and then we'll see them be connected into the Tetra systems and we'll start seeing a buildup of both the mission critical solutions alongside Tetra. And at some point, um, probably more towards 2030, we'll see a migration for some of those um, solutions um, fully onto uh, LTE. Um, but in the meantime, building of the mission critical LT networks, the hardened versions are things that are starting to happen now in two or three countries. And that I think we'll see build um, a bit of momentum over the next few years across the whole of Europe. Um, but again, 
testing uh, is very important, ensuring the mission critical KPIs and the service is robust to maintain the trust of the users is essential um, across when we're building new communications, because regardless of what the technology is, user safety, always on access to communication is still absolutely vital. Um, and just as a um, real to check here, um, sorry, I'm running a little bit behind. Um, in Finland, um, last year, uh, in fact, uh, the project actually went under a two year delay um, because they actually started testing some of the equipment, some of the MCX services, uh, looked at the, the um, hardening of the, the LT networks and realized that actually everything wasn't ready today. Um, and that, again, the users had expressed uh, opinions about if you like, the level of maturity of the, of the technology. And there's been delays put into that to make sure that actually that now they are looking to start their migration probably in 2026, 2027, rather than 2024, um, which is the original plan. So um, realism setting in, in terms of what can be done and when to make sure that there really is a proper mission critical service. Um, so very quickly, what's Sapira doing? Um, we're remaining very active in 3GPP. We're engaged with actually several ongoing broadband projects at the moment, um, but we're also building um, devices and options uh, with a full ecosystem to so handheld, vehicle devices, uh, mobile device management, accessories, very important, and MCX applications as well. And we're looking at dual mode options in all the products so we can cater for the need for device device or uh, migration uh, depending on the user's needs. Um, and we're putting those out and we will think the timeline for um, those markets are. Um, the first one was actually um, released, uh, oh, well, launched, I think, three weeks ago now. So this is a vehicle device. Um, and what we're trying to do is distill what we understand from our current Tetra vehicle devices today uh, and bring them into a product uh, which supports broadband, um, but without any compromises in terms of what users are expecting from a vehicle device today, um, along with accessories as well, of course, uh, very important. So. Our vehicle device, SCU3, designed a lot of flexibility, has mission criticality inside it. It runs Android inside the device, so it's not just a router. You can actually run your mission critical applications directly on it. Um, has a very powerful um, processor inside. Lots of storage, so real um, applications can actually sit and run on it with a lot of data there. It's 256 gig of storage inside. Um, obviously, wireless LAN, Bluetooth, Ethernet. Um, it supports dual displays, so front and back of vehicles for things like um, uh, paramedic vehicles or um, fire tenders. Um, it has the option of a second LT bearer, so we can run on two networks um, at the same time. Uh, one could be commercial, one could be mission critical, but keeping the data separate, but also uh, an optional Tetra bearer as well. So uh, we can actually, within that box, uh, within the same footprint as our current Tetra devices, we can have both broadband and narrowband operating at the same time. Uh, so we think that gives a very, very powerful um, solution to um, what people need now and how they'll migrate into their full mission critical sort of functionality in the future. We're also providing um, device management, very important to make sure we can actually deploy the devices, upgrade software, uh, make sure they're secure, uh, enforce policies, et cetera, on the way as well. Um, and again, providing patches, NOS updates, making sure everything is absolutely secure is critical for mission critical users. Um, we really can't have them using devices where there's security flaws within that. And then overall accessories as well, device to device solutions. Um, a lot of our accessories are used for our Tetra products. We will be carrying forward and using in our um, new uh, broadband products. So we will hopefully have a full solution and ecosystem um, for the broadband future. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much indeed, Peter. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot that uh, potentially we can learn from the pioneering experience in Europe, both in Finland and with the uh, ESN. Yeah. It's also pretty interesting that you ask the question or raise the question of spectrum. Um, in Australia, the ACMA has just recently come out with uh, a variety of options for using some spectrum relinquished from the MBN Direct Wireless, um, which basically the two options were either to release to the existing uh, mobile operators or to release on an apparatus uh, license based system to private operators. Uh, ACCF did put in a submission which strongly favoured the latter. Uh, yeah. 
uh, for foster innovation. Thanks yeah, very much. Like um, no I problem. Ask you necessary to stay up unless you want to for the question and answer at the end. So if yeah, no, I'll, I'll be around for it. Yeah. Around? Cool. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Okay. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Peter Scalada. Uh, Peter's going to talk about transition as well, but uh, more from a DMR based uh, to LTE. So, Peter, over to you. No, thank you, Roger. Really appreciate it. So, for all of you who don't know me, I am Peter Scalada and I'm the CEO of, Australia, of um, Smoko Australasia. Uh, as I'm certain that you're all aware, Smoko is a global product um, integration company and product company with a long standing heritage, been over 80 years. And I want to thank you for attending my CC Brightsides and my view on the transition of not just DMR, but also narrowband um, to LTE solutions. So if we can get, uh, there we go. All right, so I'd like to start this discussion by considering where we've come from as an industry. And if we think about narrowband LMR with this longevity since the 1920s and during World War II, it has successfully provided communications effectively over the decades. The key to success has been the ability to provide communications over vast distances, resilience to continue to operate under adverse conditions, and providing one-to-many communications and the reliability needed uh, to be used by public service agencies, the military, and critical business operations such as mining. However, this technology has moved with the times and successfully integrated data requirements, but is limited by the laws of physics and the bandwidth it can provide, um, obviously. With developments such as DMR tier three uh, uh, unified single block data or USBD for short, we have been successful in constantly squeezing more out of a 12 and a half kilohertz channel, but it's just not enough. However, there are times when there is either a user maybe at the fringe of a private radio network coverage and may need to progress onto another medium to continue their voice communications or have greater data requirements for real-time video streaming, et cetera. What we're seeing in the market across almost all sectors um, these days is that PMR still definitely has its place and will for some time to come. However, the need to incorporate LTE and even satellite into our solutions is here to stay as our clients at the market are requiring fast, real-time data to conduct their activities. And we're definitely seeing that also uh, from NSW, Telco and, and Sakura have the same mindset as well. So we're predicting over the next several years that our broadband solutions will grow exponentially to support our customers' needs for data intelligence. And this is why here at Samoco, we call it the concept of converged networks is front and center um, to our strategy. So converged networks from what we see are needed uh, because as a society, we have a hunger for immediate data to solve a myriad of current problem, current day problems. One example is the smart ambulance scenario where a patient has been picked up and the doctors in the hospital want to know what symptoms are being presented whilst en route to determine the right course of treatment ahead of the time. Another use case, a bit more commercial in this mode, is a delivery driver who wants to be provided um, his or her real-time route planning and to deliver their parcels and to be able to prove that the parcels have been delivered by photos being sent to their client. Or we have the very well-known scenario uh, by us here at Smoko. Uh, we have the bushfire commander who is in the field and wants to be able to see what direction a fire is traveling in relation um, to his firefighters, or his or her, I should say, and in order to plan the best way to extinguish the blaze by their team of firefighters. So with these exciting technologies that are now available, the convergence of LMR and broadband has never been more critical and our industry must continue to evolve and adapt. So what does a converged network look like? So here at Smoko, by interactions with many of our customers, we see three levels. Firstly, we see mission critical data voice over LMR, which will remain, as I've mentioned, for years to come. However, MCPTT definitely has its place and is progressing, which is good to see. Narrowband um, is still a very important part of our portfolio, providing many of our customers with both mission critical and cost effective data solution transfer. We have such solutions from the largest power companies in the UK uh, for narrowband SCARA to cancel GPS operations here in Australia who use a lot of these types of systems. However, what we're seeing through our new velocity range, which I'll speak about in a moment, is the thirst of data as well as onboard intelligence is required to absolutely improve um, efficiencies. And it doesn't always have to be a mission critical requirement, but we're seeing more and more of that um, coming on board as well. So to provide another view of what a converged network looks like, here's a typical diagram of a scenario. We have intelligent computing taking as many sources of inputs such as vehicle CAN bus, cameras, um, GPS comm ports connected to other devices in the vehicle, and even to IO ports um, to provide uh, all sorts of status inputs. 
Then that intelligent device decides potentially what to do with that data because uh, it's got uh, intelligent computing. Um, is there some processing that I can do immediately here, immediately at the one spot um, to make decisions about what to do? And then to decide, well, where do I send that data? What is the safest route or perhaps most cost-effective route to send that data um, back to a destination? Um, and it could also be that it only chooses to send critical data through. And we see that um, quite often um, these days, especially in the bus scenario, where we have a scenario where in terms in field, um, a bus may you know, want to know a breadcrumb of GPS. However, only when you know, there's an emergency on board will they start you know, sending video um, through back to a control room. But we're also saying that you know, this could be you know, sending that data over DMI, LTE, or even satellite. And the device will even store less important data and transfer it when it reaches a familiar Wi-Fi hotspot. We have quite a few customers looking at it now. Um, so then from there, we have the intelligent backend systems like I mentioned a minute ago, and even things like the Samoco VRM that can control all infield devices um, that, and systems that utilize that data in areas uh, like telematics, multimodal transport, or ambulance backend, um, et cetera. So to provide an outlook, on what a typical converged um, device looks like. Let's give you a bit of an idea of um, the new Samoco EC830. This dev device provides um, six types of connectivity, including dual SIM Wi Fi LTE, uh, dual SIM LTE, I should say, Wi Fi, uh, Bluetooth, comms ports, general IO ports, and even a connection uh, to a DMR network uh, through our own uh, SDM600 radio. And eventually, that will also, uh, with a software upgrade, will be P25 Phase 2. It is also uh, planned to be able to work with third-party satellite systems, and uh, we're already doing trials in that area. The thing I want to mention, though, that the reason why the model number is EC is because it is actually an edge computer. Um, so it is a Linux-based edge computer running IBM Node-RED to enable fast programming to your customer requirements. So it's really a computer first, and then a, uh, let's say, a comms device sort of second. Um, similar to the, uh, uh, to the device we heard previously, it is the same footprint as a Smoko DM and radio, uh, DM, uh, SDM radio, I should say. So they're actually clicking together and um, easily work together. However, what you would have also seen um, is Smoko uh, are going a lot further afield um, when it comes to this type of uh, product. As you can tell that from what you've seen in the market, the network convergence in IoT is now becoming a strong part of our future which is why, as well as developing our own IoT edge computing device, um, the Velocity 800 series that I've just mentioned, we're taking um, what we see as a good, better, best approach in the market and we're uh, and developing and also producing and, and also acquiring companies that can provide the next level as well. So the EC800 series is an excellent mid-spec device uh, providing solid cost-effective um, you know, features. But what we also seen and have seen in this market over the last couple of years is we identified the need for a bigger brother uh, for our EC800 um, or arranged devices to sort of complete you know, mission critical for high-end data users such as ambulance services. And this is where we've actually recently, or uh, well, not so recently, we've teamed up with Elcom for quite a while, but we've acquired them recently. Um, and this is a British company who you may have heard of. And they're actually an engineering company who up to have for over 20 years had long standing relationships with both the UK and Irish ambulance services and provided dump um, systems for them over that time. And they provide really a lot around data centric connectivity on their vehicles. So they're only one of two vehicles around Kodiak MCPTT on their Android based vehicle mobile data terminals and are the only vendor who run a full, fully data aggregated hardware model where multiple 4G satellite and data streams run simultaneously, eliminating any failover in the event of a network failure. So what actually, how it actually works is we're sending multiple um, streams of data um, absolutely in parallel. So it's actually duplicated. And when it gets back to the um, Thorcom server, uh, it basically throws out the duplicated data and then provides um, the data that's required over to the ambulance. So this is where we see that here in the Australian market, we can actually now provide as well a best approach um, to our velocity um, system, family of devices. So if we go in a little more detail, just in the state of an ambulance, what you see here uh, is an example of a Thorcom developed uh, Sunoco EC900 series. And the picture highlights how the ambulance is actually fitted out uh, with, with the EC950 with onboard patient monitoring systems, vehicle systems and more and utilise in this case, radio, Wi-Fi, and the multiple LTE streams in parallel, and has been doing so 
um, for the last several years. It's smart enough to know what the most cost-effective link is, and we'll use more of that versus more expensive paths to get the data to its destination. Due to the fact that it's working in collaboration with the Thorcom data aggregation service software, as I mentioned before, it will piece multiple streams of data back together to be presented to the ambulance CAD systems. So overall, um, that's it from me, and I'd like to thank you for listening to my CC um, bite-sized presentation today. But as a recap uh, of my main points, they are. LMR will absolutely remain a cost-effective solution and coexist for some time with other technologies um, such as LTE. Our customers are yearning um, for new technologies such as um, LTE, IoT and satellite on top of their existing LMR systems and it's good to see that the other speakers so far have identified this as well. Converging technologies um, create a robust, reliable, secure and interoperable uh, broadband communication systems for the future and our Samoka new velocity offerings will provide customers with the next generation of technology that is revolutionising mission critical networks, providing a variety of flexible and connected edge computing devices. Okay, so uh, that's it from my side, and uh, I'm looking forward to some questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really interesting. Uh, it's great to see uh, a real life of example of the uh, converged technologies uh, using the, uh, the ambulance uh, model. Uh, that was great, and I'm sure there'll be many questions at the end. I'd like to pass across now to uh, Dion Stevenson. Uh, Dion, I know, has been with TAPE for, for many years since I've enjoyed talking with him over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, Dion's got uh, great experience in uh, uh, mobile communications, and he's going to talk about the uh, unified solutions uh, model. Uh, Dion, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Roger, and uh, great to hear you, Peter, talk about a topic that's certainly passionate for me as well, and um, and also you touched on the sort of the, the user interface. I think this is my first time presenting at um, Bite Size or the Critical Comms Forum and things like this, so it's great to be here um, and part of part of the part of the family. But what I would like to sort of do um, for the next sort of 10, 10 minutes or so is just try and be a little bit more holistic in our thinking and just try and step us outside the technological just for a bit, just to sort of mix it up a little bit. And there's been a lot of good stuff so far. But um, change really is not a threat. It's an opportunity for us all. And survival is not the goal. Transformation success is. And that's a statement that came from a fellow called Seth Goodwin. And uh, I thought that was very appropriate because I'm, what I'm seeing when I talk to certainly um, those who are more, more wise than me is, is this can be a little bit daunting, this whole concept of radio and cellular and LTE and the mix of Wi-Fi. It, it can be, be overwhelming. And I think it's just great to take a step back and, and um, just reimagine and rethink this for a bit and see it as an opportunity for our businesses, for our families and, and our communities and countries. So, um, in particular. So when I kind of think about unified and convergence in, in, in my theme today, it's, it's really the mix of that communication means it's that multi-bearer capability, like our unified vehicle has that uh, Wi-Fi, LTE, um, Ethernet, all of that sort of standard capability that you'd expect in a vehicle box. And But what I wanted, wanted to jump in on is the infusing of operation. The tech is great, but we need to sort of flip our heads and, and think about the people that are using this equipment. Um, they get Some people get excited about the tech, others just don't, and they get frustrated when it doesn't um, kind of basically work. So we're on that growth cycle, right? And so we need to think about the processes that are in play. And um, the nice thing about radio, it is, is a relatively controlled environment. Um, it's two, um, two, one person talks at a time and someone responds and you throw LTE in that mix and suddenly you can have a two-way conversation and you've got someone trying to sort of over talk on the other. So we need to think about operational process um, as, as well. We also need to think about the time aspect, how long it takes to do things. Um, you pick up a radio, you press the button, you talk, you're communicating in a few seconds. You pick up a cell phone, it's not so quick and easy. Even if you've got a PDT application, you've still got to unlock the screen. You've got to find the app. You've got to press the button, um, unless you've got a button on the side, for example. So there's that time aspect that impacts our processes. Then there is the sort of the management of people, right? Um, when we do this whole transition, there's, there's people that are passionate with what they've had. They don't like change. 
you know, they may feel threatened because they may feel inadequate at one end of the spectrum. You may get others who are just so eager. So you get sort of two environments where you're trying to operate things in different ways. There's a clash of culture there. Um, and um, so the emotions come part of that. There's that fear of talked about that, the fear of change. And there's also that aspect of having to learn and unlearn. And, um, and, and that can be a struggle for some people. So there's that. And all of this kind of impacts on the efficiency, it impacts on the workflows we have, it impacts on our operating procedures. Um, and, and when we have the radio, the ops are generally have strict useful guidelines for how you are to talk and, and have control. And we even have console operators that can override what's going in the field. We take that into the, the, the cellular domain. Um, there's so many more options. You have even devices that are uncontrolled, they're unworldly, people bring their own. You suddenly, as, a, as an engineer, you've got not a defined parameter of hardware. You've got the wild, wild west and anything that comes out of any country in the world that you've suddenly got to design and factor in and cater for. And in, in a mission critical world, that's really risky, right? Because if someone brings a device that hasn't been vetted, we're unfamiliar with it, it's, it could cost us and, and worst case, costs, costs lives. So I guess the question is, is what are we transitioning to and from? You know, we've took, briefly just touched on my device story. Um, we've got the traditional radios. It's in a vehicle. We've got our radios on our lapel. Um, they're getting smaller. They're getting more capable. Um, they're able to do more. And um, so because they're able to do more, we need to take some of those processes and adapt them. So once upon a time, we would pick up the microphone, we would request some information, and we would get it back verbally. Now, of course, you can pick up your cell phone, you can request that information and get it yourself via some web pages and, and so forth. And of course, where the challenge comes is, is where you lose some um, technolo te te technology, right? So suddenly you've gone into an area where there is no cellular, and we know in our own Christchurch earthquakes, the cellular network is as great as it was, just got overloaded. People were more interested in their families and people that really needed to communicate couldn't. It dropped back to the radio networks to provide that lifeline that people needed and that coordination in, in the ground. So I think we can gain on having multiple devices and multiple methodologies to get that communication back. And, and I think Peter had a great example there of, of what they've done in their product range, um, which is fantastic. Um, and, it, and it's really thinking about the, the end user. There's a plug for you, Peter. Um, so I think outside the op radio operator sphere, we also need to, to step back a bit and go, well, they're not the only users in a radio network. We've got um, uh, network administrators. We've got technical Peter people. We've got management. So there's tools like our Enable Insight that kind of gives some management tools about what's going on in the network. The technical people use the things like Enable Fleet to um, do device management, update the configurations, change the configurations on the fly, group dynamics, all that sort of stuff. Then you've got the network administrators who really need to know what's going on under the hood. They are people that we need to factor in to our whole change of our technolo technolo technological footprint. So, you know, no longer are our technical people a radio engineer. They're an ICT guy who thinks they know radio. We all know the worlds are very, very different. An ICT guy will go, what could go possibly go wrong? It's a cable, you plug it into the wall, life's good. We know in radio, it's an open-ended system. You move five feet and you can lose, have a whole pile of issues. We know how to handle and deal um, and environments where communications may not be 100% secure or connected. And so we've got to allow for that. So, and, and management reporting, they don't want to see reports from five subsystems. They need to see reporting from one system. So we need to think about all of these things when we're transitioning from a pure radio network into a converged environment that, that includes um, uh, lots of devices and, and lots, of, lots of people. Mouse happy. So as alluded before, we've been, we've been heavily reliant on our radio networks to provide voice and our data was sort of the secondary consideration and that's now flipped on its head, right? Even DMR, P25, all of that stuff is actually data across the air. It's no longer voice. 
we have a data medium with services on top. That is greatly different than what we've ever had before. And it opens up a world of capability for us. And that has changed what we do and what we can do, but also how we can do it. I mean, if I look at my own daughter, um, she, she would rather text because it's quicker to do that than it is to actually call. But I noticed when the tensions rise and maybe the relationships and the friends is, you know, going a little bit un unworldly for a bit, they get on the phone, they pick it up and they actually go have a conversation. So there's a levels of communications that are going on depending on what's happening and the importance and the urgency of which we need to communicate and the need to get that direct feedback in the methodology of communicating. Um, so I know for myself, I like to talk and, and a text is quick, but if I pick up the phone, I can spend 10 minutes quite happily ch um, chatting along, uh, much to people's amazement. Um, but that has an impact on our productivity. So do we want to encourage voice comms? Or we want to encourage the use of status messaging and text messaging. And then we could have a smartphone that we can suddenly have all of these tools around um, workflow and all of those sorts of things. How does that all play together? So our world has become more than just about connecting people using voice. It's about that information pipe. And it's also about that security. And it's ensuring that all of the things we have play nicely to save a life and to provide that absolute significant care that, that our medical teams, that our fire people, our police, and even our business pe people see as critical to their business. But of course, we need to be able to handle what happens if we lose our big data pipe. What happens when we lose our cell phone connectivity? Um, as people get, start to rely more on cell phones, the use of radio drops back. And then, of course, when you've lost the cell phone, suddenly, oh, how do you use the radio again? There is a loss of familiarity that we need to factor in. There's some training, some exercises that we probably need to do to keep that level of intention, intentionally um, critical comms, um, functional for where it really, really counts. Because I think at the end of the day, people are going to do what's natural. They're going to hit the emergency button on their lapel or on their radio because they know that's what's going to get them some, um, some help. So the last thing um, I just want to sort of bring up here is I've got four minutes to go, um, is, is what it means for us as we transition and how do we do that seamlessly and create that usability that seamless that is seamless and i guess for us we have to get ourselves immersed we have to get ourselves inside our users heads no matter where they sit on the radio side or the lte side we need to understand how they operate their limitations you know finding questions what um what's that brings out the information, even scenario role play. Play this for me. How's it going to work with the new and converged world that we've got? How do we make that duplicity of operations work in, in our world? How do we take those blind operators and make them now at the forefront of knowledge? And then it's also using the right tech for the right application. It's all very well having all the latest flashy toys, but at the end of the day, it's got to work. And when the police officer presses that PDT button, it just has to go. They, they have to know it's going to be there. They have to rely on it. And of course, at the front end devices, at least they can pick up the radio and throw it at somebody if it's really, really that important. Um, so it's about trying to walk those users' shoes. It's putting on the different hats, an engineering hat, a console operator's hat, a radio user's hat. What about the money? Is that up front? Is it far away? What about vehicle fit outs? How does that work? How does that cost? Um, what's the impact of that for, for people? And the, technically, I think there is, there is a tendency to sort of have all this flashy stuff. But at the end of the day, we really want to hide the clever stuff. We want operations that are simple for people, operations where it's intuitive, operations where um, it is, it is um just makes sense. And in that, we get a sense of reliability. We get a natural way of operating our, our kit. And training becomes less central. It becomes a supplement because we've designed our products and we've designed what we do um, to be um, just, just right. So then the last aspect of that would be um, taking our multiple bearers and making those that capability um, right across the board and, and from a business perspective, provide that long-term financial benefit to the business owners. So it really is trying to immerse ourselves, trying to find a past partnership 
with people. And I think in all of this stuff and all of these transitions, we can forget the reason we're doing this. And it is for people. It's about people. It's about their families. It's about their communities. It's about um, um, humanity in general. And we need to keep that in our forefront and how we do that. But on the flip side, of course, it's also feeding our families and it's also um, providing employment and all those good things. So, so when I think about convergence and um, all of that sort of stuff, I think it is wide reaching and we need to reach beyond the technical. We need to reach into the humanity aspect of this and um, consider that, that wider picture. The Socrates has, has a quote just to finish up. Um, uh, see if my slide goes, oh yeah. Oh. The secret of transition is to focus all your energy on not fighting it or fighting the old, but on building the new. And I think as a, um, a uh, one of the many manufacturing companies that provides radio, I think there's a responsibility on all of us to go, how are we going to make this work for our, for our worlds to make it a better place? And as Angus Tate would say, the best is yet to come. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I think I've pulled us back on time. And I'll hand back to you, Roger. Thanks, Dion. That was uh, that was really interesting. A great presentation. Um, my, I was interested in the part where you uh, talked about uh, lots of people looking for for information. My experience of critical incidents is limited, uh, but in my limited experience, one of the biggest issues is uh, lots of people calling the one person on the ground asking for a situation report. Uh, hopefully, this new technology will uh, make that a little easier in the future. Uh, okay, now we need to move on. Uh, thank you again, Dion, for bringing us back on time. I appreciate that. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rob Joyce. Uh, Rob is Chief Technology Officer, uh, Nokia for Oceania, and he's going to talk about delivering Australia's critical networks. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Roger. And uh, yep, um, thanks to the, the previous speakers. I think um, you know, the definition of critical networks is, is different to each and every one of us. And maybe that's where, where I'll start in terms of how, how Nokia views critical networks, um, whether they're land-based, whether they're satellite delivered, whether they're over cellular or over private wireless. Um, and, you know, I really want to sort of, first of all, talk about that. What's a critical network? What Nokia in Australia is doing uh, in terms of delivering critical networks as, as we see them and then what does the future hold in our view for critical networks? So, you know, we've, we've all been locked down for quite some time. You could argue that in, in some people's eyes, um, this, the, the home broadband, the NBN in this case, is a critical network. It's kept us all going. It's, it's actually probably 90% of us today are either at home or in a remote location connected over a fixed line network across the NBN. So, is this a critical network? And, and you know, I won't answer it, but I think we can we can all have our own views on that. Another one uh, for those of you lucky enough to have, have, have been locked down with your children, and I've got three boys. Um, you know, you can imagine um, just how critical the the school network was. Again, delivered either over the fixed line, over over wireless in some cases, over fixed wireless access in in, in MBN's network in the in the in the uh, in the regional areas. Or even over 5G in the in the urban areas over Optus or Telstra or TPG's network. So again, was was homeschooling uh, was that uh, delivered over a critical network, or was the network that delivered that uh, classed as a critical network? Uh, this one, um, for those of you who have been lucky enough to be ill over the lockdown period, you may have had a, a, a health consultation over uh, the the uh, public network. Uh, I did. I did my back in while I was locked down, and, and I, I had to speak to the doctor over a, over an iPad uh, laid on the floor in my uh, in my office. So again, you know, critical networks definitions, um, you know, are, are out there for interpretation. And and again, finally, was this a critical network? Certainly, the the Optus Sport Network was critical at the time when when for the first time in many years. You can hear it. England were, were beating Germany. So again, lots of definitions. And, and, it, and finally, you know, a, a play on words, or is this one? We know that um, a lot of our business is in the heavy industries of Australia, in the ports, in the mines. And certainly we, uh, we connect a lot of the, the Caterpillar infrastructure to, to networks in order to automate and, and uh, make uh, those mines and ports a lot safer and a lot more efficient. 
So, so the definition of critical networks, of course, I, I get the point about um, um, safety critical and and uh, and uh, life saving networks, but there are there are you know there's many other definitions, and I think we could all all look at if it was economic stability, if it was smart city functionality, um, then critical networks span all of these. And for me, any network, whether it's um, private wireless or whether it's public cellular. Um, has this pyramid of requirements, and that's coverage, then capacity, and then capability. First of all, if there's no coverage from a, from a network, whether fixed or wireless, no service, okay? If you do have coverage, then it's all about what can we do with that? Can we, can we get a text, text message through? Can we do live video? Can we do live video in both directions? And then finally, you, 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 will, you will have seen from the way that the operators work here, it sometimes is an arms race and who's got the biggest, who's got the fastest. And for me, that's the sort of the nice to have. That's the cherry on the cake if people want to sort of talk and boast about um, bit rates. I think what we're talking about today, it's those, it's those lower two blocks, uh, essential coverage, and then adequate capacity. Um, what are we doing in Australia to, to deliver um, the at least the, the cellular side of things? Uh, one of the things that we've been doing with, with TPG is, is um, the 700. We, we heard earlier when, uh, when James mentioned some of the spectrum bands, 700 megs um, is, is the lowest cellular band currently allocated in Australia. And we've been doing some good work with TPG. You may have seen recently to try and boost that coverage. I think they went to press um, last week again that they'd covered 85% of the population in the, the top six cities with their 700 standalone network. And, and, and what this means is using a, a 5G terminal, um, one of the latest 5G terminals, so either the iPhone or the Samsung or the Pixel, these guys can connect using 5G to the 700 band. So actually, uh, in TPG's network, their biggest coverage layer is now a five a five G network, not the LTE network. So again, you know, food for thought when we've heard lots of mention about LTE. Um, well, five G is also now beginning to to be rolled out into the the regional areas and and deliver a a wide coverage footprint. And I'll come on to the the, the you know what we can and what we can't do with five G in a moment. Um, Another example of where we're trying to um, maximize coverage and minimize cost for the operators is in New Zealand. And there we have what we call this network share. So RCG, the R Rural Connectivity Group. And here the, the three CSPs or the three mobile operators there have, have teamed together in order to build a shared network. They've, de they've decided that it's not economically viable to, to, to eat for each of them to build a network. And in fact, the the government has, has got involved as well. So there's some allocation of government funds to help these three mobile network operators roll out into the, the more rural areas of, of New Zealand. And that's a, a project that we're the supplier in terms of the run on. Um, everything needs to be connected. I think, um, you know, Australia is a big place and certainly we're not going to cover it by microwave hops. We certainly need to dig fiber and some of the, longest and fastest fibers in the world now are delivered using our optics uh, technology. So again, um, it's not just about wireless. Uh, certainly, we need to have the, the backhaul in place as well. Uh, and then finally, I did mention the, the shouts. You know, we, we, we do obviously have to cater for the, for the requirements to, to keep, uh, keep Telstra and Ericsson at bay sometimes. And, and um, our two main networks being TPG and Optus, we, we certainly help them try and um, give Ericsson and Telstra a run for the money in terms of the, the sort of world first and the, the fastest networks. And, and he, here's the uh, uh, proof in point. I think we've got the fastest network um, at the minute uh, in terms of world records. We got 10 gigs out of a, an Optus site uh, back in, uh, in April. Um, moving more towards industry, I think um, whilst we do support the CSPs, the, the mobile network operators, we also... Um, we also support private wireless, uh, and here's some uh, some of the companies that we've we've delivered uh, private LTE into, and and that private LTE network uh, infrastructure now is is 5G capable. So with some of these partners now, we're beginning to upgrade them from LTE towards 5G, and we can deliver shared network infrastructure. So they if they've got a, for example, a two point uh, 
2100 megahertz band, we can deliver uh, LTE and 5G within the same band and do what we call dynamic scheduling or dynamic spectrum sharing across that band in order to deliver 5G and 4G simultaneously. And, and we now, you see in the bottom left-hand corner, we now deliver more um, private wireless networks than we do actually cellular networks. So we're, we as Nokia are really strong in this space and we, we, we look to capitalize on that as we, as we move forward. And I'll mention some of the things that we're doing there. Um, we did hear from James, um, and so I won't go into detail because I think he did more so, but certainly um, at Nokia through TPG and Optus, two of our biggest customers here in Australia, we're supporting the, the, the PSMB POC. Uh, and uh, so far, so good, I would say. Uh, and I know Jonathan Bryan's on the call who, who's leading this, but certainly we're, we're, we're really proud to be part of this and, and we see our, our place as, a, as a, a cellular network provider with TPG and Optus in terms of supporting and augmenting the, the PSMB. Um, what does the future hold um, for, for critical networks? And again, I, I use the broader sense. Um, what we've been doing recently is working with a few of our partners on winning some government grants that were, that were out there for 5G use cases. Um, and the, the federal government had this 5G innovation initiative fund that was 20 million up for grabs. And, and I'm pleased to say that, that Nokia has managed to back um, about 33% of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the projects that have won funds. Um, some, of the, some of the ideas that are out there, um, connected agriculture, uh, connected mining, uh, digital art, uh, remote firefighting drones, both land-based and air-based. Uh, and then uh, one probably closer to my heart since I'm leading the project, the, the connected uh, collaborative robots or connected cobots. And certainly, you know, we see, um, we see 5G is, is not just about a faster um, iPhone because there's very, you know, I'll be honest, there's very little difference in, in the, the user experience on a 5G smartphone if it's just a, a sort of handheld phone today. But certainly 5G will unlock um, when we move to virtual reality. You know, you won't be able to deliver virtual reality glasses using 4G. You will need 5G to do it. And, and what 5G brings is the highest speed, the, the lower latency. And so what that means is we can do all sorts of, of different use cases, both for consumers, but also for industry and also for critical industries. And so what we're doing in terms of trying to understand what people will want to use 5G networks for and what the capabilities of, of 5G networks are is we've launched two new labs in, in Australia. The first one we've, we've called the, the 5G Futures Lab, which is at the UTS Tech Lab in, in Bodney, Sydney. That's where I'm, I'm talking to you from today. Uh, and this is our sort of state-of-the-art futures lab. It looks nice. It's, it's, it's aiming at consumer, but it's also aiming at industry. Um, and then we also have our, um, what we call our national 5G in incub industry incubation lab, which is primarily aimed more at industry and more at critical industries. And this is uh, going to be deployed in, in Adelaide. It's in partnership with the South Australian government. Uh, and this will be down at lot 14. And the initial use cases there are connected trains, connected airports, and then uh, remote power line inspection using, using 5G. So um, these, both these labs uh, will, be, will be online, um, well, are online already. Uh, the, the, the South Australian one coming, up, coming on, online towards Christmas. But we, we look forward to any of you wanting to partner and, and testing things out. That's what these labs are for. They're not for Nokia just to show things off. They're there for Nokia and the wider Australian industry to come in and have a play, kick the ties on 5G and actually see what we can do with it. So, so yes, you know, LTE is here today. And, and yes, if you were going to build a, a network, you'd probably fall back on LTE today. But 5G is, is around the corner. And certainly there's, there's lots more things we can do with 5G when we compare it to 4G. Um, these are some of the partners that we're playing with in, in the lab. Um, and again, I won't, I won't um, dwell on this one. I think just to, to skip to the summary, I think you know, what, what we see, uh, what we see as Nokia and what, what generally what industry sees as a critical network is changing, especially as we start thinking about connected vehicles, um, delivery drones, et cetera, being connected to the 5G network in the future. Um, Australia's critical networks will 
underpin um, not just society, but but certainly our future. We, you know, we 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 see the investment in MBN and how that paid dividends during the the COVID lockdown, and and to be make sure that we're at the the forefront and make sure that we heard before that we have a a, a safe and connected and you know prosperous society. I think the the key is that we all work as an industry and collaborate so that you know whilst we may deliver the the low latency and high bandwidth. Somebody else has that, um, you know, critical application that can run up, up upon our our network, and obviously we'd we'd love to test those types of applications here at the at the at the UTS lab or down at South Australia with the uh, with the industrial incubation lab. So so that's it from me, Roger. I will hand back. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Rob. That was uh, really really interesting, and I think. Uh... It's a great point. We often get very excited by public safety, and, and rightly so. But the uh, the critical networks that serve our industrial base, and uh, hopefully in the future our agricultural base, uh, are uh, at least as important and at least as critical to their users. Uh, moving on now, one of the things you know, I'm an RF uh, guy by background. Get very excited by RF, um, but of course there's there's more to a critical network than just the radio part. And uh, I'm going to turn over now to uh, Ranjan Bhagat uh, to talk about a critical uh, linchpin in, in critical communications, and that is the uh, control room. Ranjan. Hey, thanks, uh, Roger. Um, great presentations earlier today. And uh, I like to say that uh, I don't think I drew the short straw <laughs> as I'm coming up at the end, but it logically makes sense because uh, we were led off by James representing the end user. And then we had uh, uh, Peter and Peter and Dion and, and Rob sort of talking about LMR and LTE and at Zetron, we sort of bring it all together. So uh, let's begin. Um, and I just realized my slides are not moving forward. <laughs> yep, I do have control. Yep, certainly not moving forward or back. Uh, Thomas, have again. you given control? Yeah, I do have control. Uh, I think maybe click in the screen and then try the arrow. Yeah, we'll try that. I did it. Perfect. Thanks again. All right, um, uh, let's get going here. So uh, look, from my perspective, um, uh, I'm looking at, we've got about 87 uh, people in the audience here, and most people know LMR really well because it's a pretty mature industry. I want to talk a little bit about uh, public safety broadband, and I won't talk too much about it because a lot's already been said. In essence, uh, you know, if you look at the classical definition of broadband, right, it means uh, uh, a wider bandwidth data transmission, example, NBN, but for public safety, uh, what it's really come to mean is much more. It's the applications that the users can expect. And that's voice, data, and video, and MCX that you will hear a lot about uh, very shortly. So uh, again, again, you heard this earlier today. Uh, we all know LMR uh, today is considered the most reliable voice link for first responders. And if you were to ask generally somebody who doesn't know a whole lot about, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about broadband and LTE as enhancing the user experience for high-speed data. And we, of course, Zetron deal with all these entities. And, and the question that's, that's asked is, is it really LMR versus broadband? Is it really a transition? And the answer is uh, both entities that we deal with, LMR companies or uh, uh, broadband LTE vendors, LMR companies, you know, great uh, maturity in understanding uh, end user requirements, private networks, voice, broadband, excellent experience historically with commercial networks um, and so on. The reality is they're both asking the same questions. Uh, the LMR company, you heard earlier, to, uh, they're looking at how are they going to leverage broadband? How will they work with uh, uh, broadband partners, how will they coexist with broadband solutions? And similarly, uh, the broadband players are asking the same question. And so the answer is it's not, it's really not LMR versus broadband, it's a journey. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
All right. Well, we are a global company. So I figured uh, because we are dealing with this experience globally, give give the users or the audience there a little bit of what's happening in the rest of the world with MCX. So North America, as you all know, AT&T has the first net contract and uh, uh, they recently disclosed that they're, they're at the 95% of their uh, you know, band class 14 build out. Um, there's, according to them, there's about 15,000 agencies that have signed up, 2.8 million connections and 3 million users was considered the high water mark. So the answer is, you know, I guess rollout's going very well. And one of the reasons is that the, the, uh, the user base has extended beyond what was originally intended, which was, of course, for uh, public safety, but now it's being extended to military and other users as well. So, um, and with IoTs coming along as well, the potential addressable market uh, is expected to exceed 10 million users with MC data and video to be launched next. So all in all, uh, lots to be learned from that experience, especially for us here in Australia, uh, but going very well. Now, having said that, uh, while AT&T has the first net contract, it's not a monopoly in terms of MCPTT and MCX services. Uh, there are other telcos, Verizon, Southern Link that have launched similar services, and it's great to see competition. Uh, in Canada, again, uh, they're going to be using the telecom carrier model, a little bit different than the US, and we expect to see commercial launch of MCX services very soon. Our neck of the woods, Asia Pac, uh, uh, we all know South Korea's SafeNet is actually quite progressed, um, primarily been dealing with Korean companies on that, uh, and they're expecting to be largely completed in the next couple of years, so uh, good on them. Heard a lot about the, our own public safety mobile broadband network here um, earlier from James and others, and it seems to be going very well. I haven't seen a specific timeline, uh, but it sounds like there's a really great plan, probably next three to five years. But we all know one thing, and we've learned this from the other people's experiences and given our own challenges with uh, our size of the country uh, and where our customers are, uh, certainly with Australia, one size fits all isn't going to work. And that's pretty well understood now. Across the Tasman, New Zealand, uh, NGCC, look, uh, uh, you know, they, it's been open for bidders since Jan 21st. Um, and that's in the process of, I guess, uh, being planned and built out over the next few years as well. And we'll hear more about that uh, as it progresses. India is another one uh, where they have a similar program uh, in the next, uh, you know, uh, perhaps five to seven years. And we heard a little bit about this earlier uh, uh, from Rob, uh, but there is uh, certainly some greater uh, adoption of private LTE that we are seeing in our region here, uh, a lot uh, with some rail related projects. And as you would all know, with F FRMCS, um, uh, which is linked with 3GPP as well. Uh, and expected to eventually replace the 2G-based GSMR technologies, uh, there is some momentum there and the resources market as well. Uh, with the uh, uh, EMEA, again, won't get into a lot of detail. Uh, as alluded to earlier, countries have plans, but there are being delays uh, that are being caused uh, for good reasons. So I'm going to move on very quickly to uh, some of the good things that we are seeing, the standards bodies have been excellent. Uh, they are influencing product development cycles for vendors uh, such as us, certainly increasing market-based competition and choice, and most importantly, uh, defining interoperability. You heard that a lot earlier. Uh, and typically what we are seeing here is once the standard gets released, it takes about three years for commercially viable solutions. Uh, 3GPP hats off to them. Uh, They've been fabulous. Um, and the only point I'll make here is, is with all the releases, 3GPP release 16, uh, which is the latest set of fully ratified standards for uh, the MCX uh, uh, solutions, uh, is actually being widely accepted by industry as well. And you will expect to see a lot of uh, solutions, vendor solutions coming out compliant with that. In fact, recently Etsy concluded their plug test. We were participants in that as well. And we were amazed. There was about, I think, 30 odd entities. We tested with quite a few of them. And uh, again, great results. 
release 17 coming. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about that in the future. Uh, but I would say for the purposes of building out robust solutions, release 16 has already set the platform for us. Uh, and there are other LMR standard bodies prior to 3GPP that are working very well on this. The TIA in North America, uh, traditionally known for P25 standards, but they're working on IWF solutions, uh, focusing on CSSI and DFSI uh, for connectivity, NIPSTIC, and TCCA, uh, our own uh, organization uh, that has hosted this, uh, they're working on a, a control room implementation guide project that we are participating in. And it's great to see that based on real use cases, which makes us pretty excited. So from a command and control perspective, right, we're the intelligent glue, as I said, we bring it all together. And a, Interoperability is going to be key. It was always key earlier with voice, and it's going to be no different for uh, the services that broadband and LMR will bring, and primarily related to data. So the focus is going to continue to be to deliver information from a centralized information hub to the right resources, uh, accepting your broadband media, pictures, video, uh, through a common gateway, irrespective of source. Uh, transforming that into uh, some actionable decisions. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, it's got to be seamless between the different agencies, um, uh, certainly within, uh, within a particular country. So the tips that we give for anyone, if you're an end user uh, who's looking at building blocks for how do we leverage this is don't manage them separately. You know, uh, partner and integrate, and this applies to vendors as well. Certainly, open standards are always the best. You heard a lot about P25, DMR, Tetra, great standards. They've done very well. 3GPP doing exceptionally well. And that will ensure interoperability for you uh, if you're an end user or if you're a vendor building those solutions. Use cases, huge. Focus on, I think I heard Dion say that, focus on solutions versus technology. Uh, great examples of use cases earlier with uh, with the, with the AMBOs uh, and the first responders. Um, and again, that's what the end users need to be thinking about. Costs, of course, important. Coverage again. Uh, the last bullet here is related to managing information overload. Uh, with the uh, advent of more data, uh, we need to be careful about what it means for the, for the first responder and the dispatchers. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. So uh, we won't thank Zuckerberg for this, but the metaverse is here. But the reality is the national uh, public safety broadband oh. networks are in their infancy. Um, and from our perspective, broadband will bring greater mobility and access to data. We recognize that, but it can overwhelm the traditional uh, comm centers as well. So we do need to think about how to manage that. Again, uh, with data comes more data privacy and security issues. So got to think about that as well. And the reality is, again, the, the LMR technology solutions will gain efficiencies. You heard a lot about that earlier uh, as well from uh, uh, Peter and Simico and Sapura as well. And again, we summarize by saying these technologies will coexist in the near to midterm. Certainly, depending on the investment cycles, if somebody has invested in a P25 DMR Tetra network in the last few years, it's unlikely they will switch right away. But if somebody's on an analog network, they might skip a generation. So use cases will drive the increased adoption of broadband. One of the examples that we see is assistive uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And I say assistive, meaning things that will make the control room operator uh, smarter will augment human judgment uh, in terms of uh, real time to protect life and property all in a transparent manner. So today interoperability is happening. Uh, the key is to make it all happen seamlessly. And, and that's what we're all working towards. You heard that earlier. And we strive to keep working towards that. Uh, with that, I guess I'll just say that uh, we do have a white paper on interoperability uh, that's available on our website. Go have a look. And I'll be happy to take questions. And thank you again to the organizers for the opportunity, as well as to my peers who made some great presentations. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ranjan. Um, absolutely no question that uh, interoperability is uh, key to our future. 
Um, and that, of course, as you pointed out, is based on standards. I'll now hand over to uh, Kevin Graham, Kevin's uh, ACCF Director uh, and CEO elect of the TCCA, and he'll talk about uh, some of the uh, developments in standards and the new releases. Kevin, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Rod Roger. Um, it's with pleasure I uh, am able to join the session today, and um, I'm also very humbled to have been elected as the new TCCH CEO. I actually started that role in parallel with the existing CEO last month, and um, I've been very fortunate to have had 20 years working as a director and the founding chairman of the ACCF. Today, I plan to share some topics on the roadmap for mission and business critical communications and the way that the TCCA, um, ACF and our global members and also our global affiliate organisations are organised and some of the actions that have taken place recently and what are some of the priorities over the next uh, 12 months. But just a, a few more words about the TCCA. As you all know, we had our roots in the land mobile radio digitization and standardization over 25 years ago. Um, and that started with the original development of the Tetra standards. Uh, ever since the TCCA has developed and enhanced our collective expertise in the requirements of critical users, and now apply this to the critical broadband world. We've worked closely with Etsy through a long-standing cooperation agreement that started back in the early days of Tetra and continues on with the enhancements going on in in the, that narrow band standard. And more recently with 3GPP, where TCCA has been a market representation for critical communications ecosystem. In fact, the TCCA and its members were the first one recognized um, in this area by 3GPP. From narrow broadband to critical broadband, um, our members come from all around the world using, and we've seen that TCCA has now become a focal point to channel collective knowledge, um, innovation, consultation, and, and most importantly, to ensure that we have you know, a, efficient um, ways to progress the standards and the technologies in conduct, conjunction with the industry. We have a number of really um, cherished partnerships that have been cultivated over the you know, many years. And, and this is just a few of those. Um, and you know, both uh, in the two-way fashion, the regional forums that, that work on, as local chapters of the TCCA um, are extremely important in channeling information of regional interest, um, regional priority into the TCCA um, and partner network. Uh, to assist us in our work, both in the, the um, enhancements of the standards and the prioritization in which we go about that. Just a quick pictorial, just to remind everyone about the organizations and peers working in both the narrowband standards and the broadband. So, Etsy's responsible for the standards for both Tetra and DMR, while TIA in the US is responsible for the P25 narrowband standards. And work can, is continually going on with all these three standards um, and enhancements to ensure the, uh, these standards and the technology um, meet end user functionality going forward. So the broadband is, is completely uh, undertaken by 3GPP. And as everyone knows, 3GPP has been responsible for the cellular standards right from GSM through to the current implementations of both 4G and 
the significant work going on in the 5G space. I mean, one part of this that's you know extremely important for the mission critical um, functionality, both in terms of PTT, uh, video, and data, is the work that needs to go on in implementation of the interworking function that has been defined through the 3GPP standards with the other parts of the ecosystem that will help um, enable the interoperability and um, conformance of the various wireless bearers. I put this slide up just to show you, if you are not aware, what are some of the relationships between all of the entities that are engaging with 3GPP. For those that may not be aware, there are six or actually seven, two out of Japan, um, what are called operational partners. Um, these are made up of standards development organizations that are relevant in these regions. Uh, it's, it's interesting to note here as well that uh, Africa, Latin America, uh, Russian Federation and Australasia have no SDOs present, presently um, interacting with 3GPP. So companies and entities in these regions need, have chosen uh, one of the seven organisations in which they can uh, have representation. This slide shows also the market representation partners, which TCCA is one. Uh, you have the 5G projects as well as the SDOs. And I've depicted the, with the thick blue arrows, the paths where representation is provided to 3GPP. And these blue arrows cover all of the requirements from both consumer end use cases through to uh, use cases and representation for various verticals um, that exist and that are emerging uh, that need to be catered for by the standards. And I think you know the important point to note here is there the thin blue line, as I, I would like to call it, is the thin blue line of mission critical functionality. And we shouldn't forget that, uh, you know, against all of the other uh, proponents involved in the standards, um, we need to punch above our weight as a, a mission critical, business critical, um, collective stakeholder um, liaison to ensure that the programs for critical standards development are in, hand, in fact heard and um, carried forward through 3GPP. We're competing against a number of very um, heavy duty uh, colleagues, and we need to make sure that our mission critical functionality is well represented, um, collected and prioritized and elaborated um, effectively into the, the standards bodies. This is what I call the uh, mission critical lasagna, the common ecosystem layers that are uh, involved in all of the work that we are attempting to undertake with our members and our affiliates, both from a standards level an industry implementation, system implementation level, uh, the network operator environment, the applications that need to be delivered uh, to support the use cases, the operational procedures that, that, have, that are uh, involved with both agencies and other mission and business critical users from the various verticals. And on top of this is the government involvement, both from a legal and regulatory perspective. And this includes the harmonization and, and equitable access to spectrum to deliver the, this capability to the critical users within our uh, jurisdictions. I think a number of us 
of us have seen this type of chart before, but you know, we we are now seeing through real life experience uh, the pathfinding projects like UK, South Korea, where they are planning a total trend um, move to LTE. We we're seeing a number of countries where they they have a are looking at a managed approach to transition um, based on the fact that they have potential end of technical life uh, for some of their existing uh, national PPDR networks, uh, whether it's technical end of life or economic end of life of that, um, they are considerations in terms of the timescales they have for transition and or augmentation of broadband capability. And obviously the rail industry is one that is on a very tight timeline, given there's expected obsolescence of the G GSMR uh, rail network technologies across the world. TCA working groups are the main drivers of our work. They are open to all qualifying members and we encourage the widest possible participation. In many cases, we work through project specific task forces. We also have country and regional specific forums that focus on specific geographic requirements. And obviously ACCF in Australasia is one of those um, examples. I'd like to just cover a few areas in which uh, we are devoting significant resources at the current time, um, particularly around our work in the critical broadband space. The, the Critical Communications Broadband Group have had many members contributing to a number of tasks recently. Uh, and a number of guides and papers have been published. And we have some more white papers on 5G, 4, 450 megahertz, um, and broadband device procurement that will be published shortly. A couple of others are in finalization, um, along with many more that are contemplated. Um, some of those task forces that uh, have been formed relate to 5G satellite communications and cybersecurity work that we're attempting to start that focuses in on the mission critical elements uh, and mission critical network uh, areas of, of interest. Ranjan mentioned the 3GPP release program. We're currently working on release 17 uh, and work is, has commenced on formulating the requirements for release 18. And you can see the uh, proposed dates for the, um, the work in these particular areas. So, so where are we heading from current work on release 17 and work commencing on release 18? In general, we have enhancements that are, are being worked on in terms of both coverage, capacity, and other enhancements. And these include ensuring that the work that's been done with mission critical standardization in 4G is translated to the 5G domain. Importantly, there's work being done around the enhancements for the future rail communications requirements around content and media servers, file distribution, um, and particular areas of interest for public safety, like the isolated UTRAN for public safety. We're also working on common features with other 5G services, such as satellite 5G access. There's work around drones, uh, multicast, unicast, and broadcast capability. And as mentioned previously, device to device and side link are important attributes that are required by um, particularly our, our first responder users. Another area that was touched on was around open service um, APIs, generic API platforms for all services 
and also in respect to um, user, broadband user devices. Some time ago, TCCA was involved through members from our user community and government user community to look at how they established a, um, a more formalised way of working. TCCA sponsored that original work a few years ago and recently um, the legal and regulatory working group was established. And this was to focus on common legal and regulatory issues arising from um, the evolution of voice-centric narrowband to information-centric mission critical services. So at the moment, the working group is for government operators in the SEP member countries in Europe, um, but they have indicated they may in engage with other government operators. And I think this is a really good um, and interesting and topical area across many jurisdictions. and operators cannot participate due to some of the confidentiality reasons of the information exchanged. If anyone is interested in knowing more about this, um, they're more than welcome to, to contact me. Um, I know some of the representatives of this are quite willing to share non-confidential information around the work that they're doing in terms of legal and regulatory to pave the way for their public safety mobile broadband strategies. Uh, looks like I've lost, I think we're right now. One further important area that is being undertaken um, with heavy TCCA involvement is around all of the uh, testing and conformance. Now, I'd just like to ensure people are aware, aware of the sort of th three layers of testing that are essential for um, ensuring that solutions do in fact meet the standards, in which case that a conformance testing regime is, is being put in place or has been put in place to ensure that any implementation under test does actually conform to the standard or the reference implementation of, that, of the standard. Um, secondly, as we've been used to within the digital LMR market, whether that's Tetra, DMR, or P25, there's been interoperability testing set up to, to ensure that two or more implementations actually work together. And then the next layer is to ensure that there is, in terms of performance testing, that the implementation test, uh, implementations are under test actually meet the, the core criteria um, and key performance indicators, whether that's call setup, delay, latency, voice quality, et cetera. And the TCCA is involved in, in essentially four programs. One is the MCX plug test program that has been uh, organized via Etsy um, that was mentioned by Ranjan. And, we, and there's extensive involvement in that from industry vendors to ensure that the implementations um, and their, their capability against the standard um, are, are closely matching. And more importantly, to make sure that if there are any ambiguities in the standard, that these are flushed out and improved and enhanced going forward. There's also been a program set up with the Global Certification Forum. Um, for those that don't know, GCF's involved in all of the de device um, certification for, if you like, the, the
as a viable certification program against which current and future devices could be certified for mission critical functionality. There's a mission critical testing as a service platform, which is a program that is due to be completed middle of next year. Um, it was funded out of NIST um, PSCR uh, program and is, and is a cooperation of a number of partners to deliver a, um, a, a test platform um, that could evolve into a, a, a testing as a service. And in parallel, we're working with GSMA on how did some of these, these uh, conformance interoperability performance testing translate into field test cases. So I think you know, the important message from all of this um, and the work that's been done globally um, and the participation by global members through TCCA and their peers in the US is that we must make sure that we cooperate on a regional level. We must make some effort to come together to start to ensure we are channeling our requirements into the SDOs, the market representation partners like TCCA, uh, to ensure that the priorities for mission critical through the value chain are being realized and realized as quickly as possible. And I really you know, implore all of those that are on the call from our region to consider how they might be able to contribute to this effort um, and support the effort of those that are already contributing. It's, um, it's astounding the amount of horsepower that has been thrown at this work from both the end users and the industry. It, it's amazing. And there's, there's more work that needs to be done. So I, I would really ask if, if you're um, interested in this area that you get in contact with the ACCF or the TCCA and, and see how we can work together and how you can benefit also from the um, information sharing that goes on within the organisation and our, our peers and partners at the moment. I'd just like to, to, to quickly, well, sorry. Let me just quickly outline some of the valuable resources available to um, those that may be listening. Um, clearly through the TCCA and the ACCF websites, we've got a lot of publicly available resources uh, from news, white papers, guides. There's a number of webinar recordings for part, from past events that have been conducted program and, and there's a amount of information that's member only information um, you get access and participation uh, to the TCCA working groups uh, and some of our task forces you can get involved in the TCCA uh, and partner programs um, and that includes you know, um, sharing some of the information and observer programs and others that are part of our our uh, Etsy plug tests, the IOP work, the certification work, the um, emission critical services work we're doing. And obviously- Kevin, I'm, I'm gonna call time on you, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Uh, there's other references here to the events coming up. And I know Roger's gonna speak a bit more about the Comms Connect event coming up in March where um, yeah, yeah, there's you know, a very useful program being organized. Um, clearly, there's other bite-sized events coming up. Have a look at these links. Um, and you know, another key event is the next Critical Comms World in June 2022 in Vienna. Uh, we've also got training programs that are being prepared for delivery as we did with LTE programs during 2021. So thank you all for your attention. Um, I look forward to, uh, to your support and your engagement um, in my new role as TCCA CEO. Thanks very much, Kevin. Really appreciate that. Um, there's a vast wealth of resources that are there. 
Uh, and as you uh, correctly pointed out, uh, we put on this uh, bite-sized event to uh, compensate for the fact that uh, there was no uh, Comms Connect on uh, in November as normal. Uh, the good news is that uh, the Comms Connect will be running in March 2022. Uh, ACCF will be conducting a town hall as part of that event to uh, feed into the event to explore further uh, critical communications uh, uh, in Australia and New Zealand and around the world, uh, and that will be a full afternoon. But now it's time to move on to uh, questions and answers. And uh, I'll just run through. We've got a number of questions. Uh, the first is for Peter Hudson, actually. Peter, can you comment on some of the hurdles that uh, ESN encountered as the pioneer in using commercial broadband operators for public safety? Um, yes, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> We have, some, we have some NDAs in place, which I have to um, respect. Um, I think uh, I think uh, in all honesty, ESN started out probably too quickly. It also started before standardisation actually started happening. So they started down a proprietary route, which was known at the time. It was a conscious decision. Um, so there have been quite a lot of, I think, resets and sort of... Uh, re-looking at what they do, um, but they have, I guess as part of that process, um, being a little bit being a little bit ahead at times of the, uh, of the actual MTX standardization, which of course has caused a few problems along the way. Uh, and they are um, try, genuinely trying to get a service that is as good as the airwave network uh, it's, it's gonna replace, which is quite a tall order. It's a, it's a good network. Um, so I, I think, and, and user expectations are really high. The bar is high um, for what they're trying to do. So, so they've got a number of, if you like, sort of hurdles to get over, but they are also hitting sort of genuine issues. So uh, things like uh, performance of EDNOBs, et cetera, when actually trying to set up group calls very quickly uh, are all things which they're now running into, which are being raised back within 3GPP, et cetera. So they're practical problems around using, if you like, commercial equipment in a slightly different way. Um, so numbers of problems around that, but it's largely, I think, because they, you know, they did start very early and they've probably been a little bit ahead of the curve in some cases uh, in actually uh, finding some of the issues. Yeah, I think that's very true. And uh, hopefully we get the chance to learn from uh, from some of those things. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I appreciate okay. you managing the balance between NDA and yeah. non-NDA. <laughs> no problem. Uh, the, the next question is for Peter Scarlatta. Uh, Peter, you mentioned IoT as being uh, an, a key and emerging part of critical communications infrastructure. Can you elaborate a bit on some of the examples where that's being used today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've got quite a few examples um, at, the, at the moment. So our uh, new released um, EC800, which has only been out a month, by the way, is already being used by um, an Australian fire agency um, who uses a tablet, for example, to display the location of their firefighters, which is completely interfaced with P25. So it's the combination of P25 and, um, and uh, we say LTE there. Internationally, um, as I mentioned also in my, through my presentation, um, the Irish and the UK ambulance services use the um, Falcom home device where they're um, completely taking um, data back from all the uh, items uh, in or the technology inside the ambulance and piping that back through to the CAD systems through multiple streams. So that's just a couple of um, things there and there are plenty more examples. Perfect. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, James, the next one's for you. Um, you. You mentioned that there were opportunities for industry to get involved with the uh, Connectivity Innovation Centre that you've set up. Uh, can you elaborate a bit about how how that's done and who to contact? Yeah, look, uh, Roger, uh, at the moment, we're, we're sort of in the throes of establishing the engagement um, sort of approach. So we've just, as I said, announced uh, the leads, or the joint leads um, for that. Um, and we can come back to this forum with some more detail on, you know, the best way to engage on those problem statements. So. I'm happy to um, send that out to this to this group and to the attendees here today in terms of the, the best formal way to to, um, to tap into that. Oh, that's great. That'll be really good. Thank you very much. No um, problem. The next question is for I think for Dion. Hang on a second. Yeah, Dion. Um, uh, people were interested in your discussion on user training and how we enabled users to function in a fallback situation when the rich data feeds that we're getting from some of the broadband services are lost. 
Sure, there was a couple of the questions there, um, Roger, for me. So just I'll pick up on the first one first, the fiber security one. Um, I think that is massive. I think we are seeing more and more the need to secure the data as it goes across and uh, the air, but also more particularly as it goes across the internet as we use that as a bit of a backbone for moving data around and having things in the cloud. So, and then there is the whole privacy aspect, which is legislated in many countries around the world. So I think there's, it's a big issue and I think it would be unwise not to um, give some strong thought around that space. So with the user training, um, I think when it comes to that, it's a great topic, right? And I think repetition is the key. I think when you're talking about users and how you enable those users to function, it's keeping that information in front of them regularly. It's, it's having them um, use it, almost forcing them to use it in scenarios every now and again, um, just to ensure that they kind of know what to do when they need to fall back. So those operating procedures are not lost. That would be my suggestion there. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, a question here really for all panelists. Um, I think for all the presentations, coverage and resilience were recurring themes. Um, so what, what do the panelists see as the emerging technologies in coverage extension? Uh, this is open to anyone to go for. <laughs> Otherwise I'll pick someone. <laughs> Yeah, look, um, I think I can mention one thing. Uh, for example, what we spoke of a few um, solutions there. One is our DMR coverage extender, uh, where that it actually enables uh, through a DMR network. If you have a portable, it can bounce off a, a mobile and a vehicle and get back to the network. Um, so that's been out for about a year now, now and um, is, is doing really well. Uh, and of course, the extension by LTE and satellite. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we also have technology for that, as do others. Um, where now you can actually drive out of a, you know, a radio network and the system will automatically flip over and um, go through to LTE. So that is, um, that is now available. Fabulous. Um, any other one? people want to comment on that at all? Uh, yeah, I can say, I think I agree with those, those sentiments. I think the, the key thing we've got to consider is actually keeping the mission critical link. So actually the call to your service that users expect across whatever extensions happen to come. So. Um, I think people talk about Wi-Fi, um, uh, satellites, various other things. I think in all possible, but we're just going to be very, very cautious that the actual quality of service you get across all these different links and the, and the intervening hops actually does provide the real service the users want. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and uh, Robbie, I think um, just some of the spectrum bands that we've been look looking at and seeing getting hot now, the... Um, the sort of 410, 450, maybe not in Australia, but certainly elsewhere in the world, um, is, is sort of coming back into play. And I think that really, you know, if it's going to be terrestrial-based coverage, you know, clearly 4, 410, 450 is, is key to that. Um, if it's going to be, uh, and that probably is going to be augmented by satellite. I think um, we heard mention of that and, and we're, we're very keen on uh, some of the players, especially the ones that will or claim they'll be able to deliver a 5G signal from space direct to an existing handset. And I think that really sort of, um, you know, negates the need for new satellite dishes on the ground, such as we see with Starlink. But certainly there's all sorts going on out there, but I think it's going to be a mix of uh, terrestrial and satellite in the next next 10 years for sure. Yeah, yeah. That, Roger, sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say the same, that it, uh, I, I <laughs> Kind of maintain there's no one size that fits all unless you're a very small operator uh, but it, it just sort of echoing what's already been said um, uh, we do also see some greater uh, uh, emergence of uh, non-terrestrial networks over time an example of that of course is what 3gpp is doing uh, in release 17 they actually will have um, uh, some standards to actually manage the integration of that the interoperability of NTRs with the terrestrial cellular technology as well. So that's a good indication of what the standard bodies are thinking anyway. So if you just go add, as I said, you add the rule of once the standard gets ratified plus three years to when you know, the market can expect robust solutions, you know, you're probably what, maybe five years away from something like that. Yeah, 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 I think that's right. Um... Some of these satellite applications, I guess, are particularly applicable for where latency is the major issue. I'm guessing, Rob, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, what we're seeing from uh, 
from some of the results from Starlink. I mean, they're getting down to sort of 40 milliseconds and, and they, they claim they can get lower than that. Um, and, and for most applications, you know, 20 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds is, is probably more than enough, you know, in, in terms of the, the cost coverage compromise. Uh, yeah, you're not, you're not going to want to be operated on by a Da Vinci robot in the middle of the outback by a, a satellite link. But certainly, you know, if it's uh, driving a, a road train across Australia, 40 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds is, is probably doable if there's some onboard sort of localized sensing and, and safety measures as well. So, yeah, it's, it's clearly you can't change the laws of physics. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for sure many applications could fall within that envelope of 20 to 40 milliseconds, I think. Thanks, thanks. Um, the next question is, uh, again, for all panellists. It's, it's very interesting. It's come from Cologne, uh, from an old buddy of mine, Barry Hack. Uh, so Barry must be up very late, I think, or up very early, one, one way or another. The question he's asked is, is really interesting. Um, what he's saying is, uh, if we assume that we keep narrowband services running for the next few years, why are we bothering with LTE? Why, about, why don't we just make the leap to 5G? Don't know who wants to pick that one up. I'm happy to have a go at that one if, if you want. I think um, I don't think it's um, one or the other from, from our perspective. Um, when we talk about broadband, we certainly um, we're talking about building on um, the existing sort of generations of technology and, and in some instances today that's still going to include 3G um, but definitely as we move forward um, that foundation becomes 4G and, and and yeah no question in the future 5G um, there's definitely some considerations around which generation supports specific um, standardised feature sets that may be of interest um, for you know mission critical communications but um Ultimately, at the end of the day, I think you, we are talking about building on top of um, the existing or the generations that exist, and then leveraging um, the specific version that may have the feature set that you know a customer or end user is interested in. Yep. So it's not binary in, in my view. Yep. Yep. Uh, Roger, I would uh, sort of echo that again. Uh, I agree with James. It's not sort of one or the other. And one of the things I alluded to in my presentation is. Uh, it depends, the market forces will decide this, but also will depend on where that individual client is on the current investment cycle. And I gave an example of, if you look at the classic, you know, LMR progression, right? Analog networks, digital uh, 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 standards came along and some people went P25, some Tetra, some, some DMR, and then LTE, 4G, and there's 5G, 5GS, and so on. And in some cases, if you are, you know, you're a huge client, but for some reason you haven't you haven't migrated from analog to digital. You might skip a generation and go straight to uh, LTE, or and in other cases. So it all. I think it's 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 not a to answer your the question of uh, our friend in Cologne, who I don't know what time it is there, but <laughs> hats off to him for staying up this late. I think the, I think you will see in some cases clients will do that, and again it will be based on their. Uh, you know, their individual requirements. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I think it's also worth saying, it's, I agree, it's not one or the other, it's probably one then the other or a combination of both. But we've got to be careful that we don't, everyone's not chasing jam tomorrow. So the 4G standards for LTE are just about stable and you know, a lot of the holes are fixed. 5G, the ink just drying on the paper. If we all say it's the next thing, then we never actually achieve it. So we have to put a stake in the ground, start somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dion, I'm not sure how much you can say, but uh, New Zealand's going down a similar track, sort of using what's available today and building on it for the future. Is that That is absolutely right. And I think in the New Zealand space, you're at the mercy of um, the national providers, to be fair, um, and um, available spectrum. And I'd also suggest that I think in Europe, while there might be a uh, population density that would support a, an LTE only sort of infrastructure. I think out in um, New Zealand and Australia and the US, that's just not commercially feasible. Um, so I think that the whole the whole convergence is, is going to have a bigger part for us out on this side of the world. Yeah. Um, anybody else want to comment before we come to a close? All right. Well, I think it just remains for me to. Uh, Firstly, remind everybody that uh, 
of the Melbourne Commons Connect, 8th or 10th of March. We'll continue this discussion uh, and there are what I've already seen many exciting presentations at that event. So I hope to see you all there in person. Uh, secondly, please consider joining the ACCF because uh, it's uh, through the ACCF that you can get this kind of information uh, on a consistent and regular basis and know what's happening around the world and, and be showcased to the world. And, and lastly, to uh, really go through and thank firstly everyone for attending and spending the uh, two hours online. And we peaked, I think, at 101 attendees, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and to thank uh, James, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Scalada, Dion, uh, Rob, Ranjan and Kevin for their time in presenting. So thanks very much to everybody and uh, see you in March at Comms Connect.